Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual pain clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in beautiful, sunny, gosh, not a cloud in the sky, Hernando County. And with me today is one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Bernie. How are you doing, Bernie? I'm just doing great, Bill. Thanks for asking. And also with us today is our new, yeah, you're still new. You're close enough to being new. It's a month new today. Form. A what? A month today. To, I was oh. hired a month ago today. My first day was a month ago today. Time flies. It seems like you just started yeah. a few days ago. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Feels like it. You're but still our, new to our something still bad new Florida friendly landscape coordinator, Colby Pitts. So Colby's our FFL coordinator here for Hernando County. So welcome everybody. As always, if you have any questions, any comments, anything like that, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will figure out an answer for you. And if you have something that you have a problem or issue with that you want to send pictures of, let me go ahead and throw my email up here. Because if you take a picture and email it to me, I can go ahead and open my email and share it on the screen here. It's technological magic. And we can all see the picture of the the plant, the tree, the grass, and we can all help you figure out what's wrong with it. If you notice, my background picture today is somebody's lawn who lives in Spring Hill. And um, I think that maybe once upon a time it used to be a St. Augustine lawn. It's really hard to tell at this point. But this was a situation where they um, were complaining that they were only allowed to water once a week and only on just one certain day per week because they had just fertilized this lawn. And that apparently was gonna make it look green and beautiful once again. And they needed to water the fertilizer in, otherwise that fertilizer would burn the grass. Well, number one, honey, you don't have any grass to burn. There's, I see some weeds. I see maybe a couple little remnants of runners of St. Augustine there. Um, you can water your grass all you want, every day, all day and maybe grow rice out there, but your lawn is history. And what probably did it in was just cutting it way, way, way too short and a lot of other poor management techniques. So, so that is today's background for today. But if you guys have any pictures of your own, send them. I'll go ahead and share them. We'll come up with an answer. And I promise that we won't pick on you about anything. This is an educational show here. So... Buddy from up in the Panhandle, good morning. Cindy from Pinellas County, how are you? Uh, Darla is over in Volusia County. We used to live over in Deltona. Before that, we lived in Sanford. So I'm very, very familiar with Volusia County. It's growing like crazy over there. Oh, my gosh. Teresa is here with us kind of in the background today also. She put a link up to a disease that's called take all root rot, and this affects St. Augustine grass, and we have lots of problems with it here in Hernando County. In other counties, maybe your soil is different and the environment's different. St. Augustine can grow really well in certain areas, but some areas it just doesn't do well. Bernie, do you ever get any questions about St. Augustine grass from people who live in downtown Brooksville? Not, not very many. The grass, St. Augustine does pretty well in downtown Brooksville because they have an entirely different soil type. There, there's a lot of clay in the soil uh, in the immediate downtown area of Brooksville, and uh, things tend to work a lot better. I have, I have had complaints, but I. I don't get the uh, take all root rot problems uh, down there. I, uh, in, in fact, it, the uh, lawns are more tolerant of shade in that area, which would kind of surprise me. But uh, uh, if, if you have pure sandy soil, you really have to know what you're doing to, to keep St. Augustine going. And I, I believe that the take all got such a, a firm establishment here in the sandy areas because the commercial people uh, were extremely late in recognizing that it wasn't chinch bugs 
Uh, and, and in fact, a, a lot of them still, 15 years after this became a major problem, still treat for chinch bugs when they have take also. Uh, it, it's, it's sad, but you know, grass is not really something that, that's happy in Florida. And uh, if you came from the north and, and you want north grass, it's just not going to happen. Maybe if you refrigerated the lawn and put down ducky blue, it'd work. <laughs> Uh, in our sand, uh, you you pay your choice, your your money, and you take your choices. If, if you don't want to do a lot of dollars in in the lawn, uh, you don't have a lot of lawn. And if if you uh, really want a, a great lawn, and 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 you learn, and 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 don't mind doing the scouting and, and uh, the preventive things, you can have a pretty decent lawn. Actually, these grasses are amazing, considering that. Uh, we're forcing something to grow here that absolutely would not be here on its own, no matter what. So with that said, uh, I love your picture. That it is <laughs> so typical what happens. That that lawn, uh, it looks like what you get when you take weed and feed and fertilize the lawn on a 95 degree day. That. Uh, yep, that'll do it. That exact same problem. So your neighbor's nice and green and you suddenly turn brown overnight, uh, it's pretty easy to tell what you did. Now, it's funny here, Bernie and Colby, I'm going to turn both of you off for just a moment so that you could see the neighbor's lawn across the street in this picture. Had to turn myself oh, no. off also so that people could see that. But you see the neighbor across the street has a perfectly green lawn. And I looked at that picture really closely when I first got it and blew it up. And it looked like they actually cut it fairly high. Whether or not it's four inches high, I really can't tell from a picture at that distance. But this gentleman who whose lawn we're looking at up close here complained that how come my neighbor across the street is able to water their lawn every day? Yeah. Uh, well, they're not allowed to water their lawn every day. And if you continue doing that in Hernando County, our Hernando County code enforcement people do enforce those rules. And if they drive past your house and see the sprinklers going at the wrong time or the wrong day for your address, they will mail you a ticket, a fine, starting at $100. So. Mm -hmm. I will say too, um, I recently uh, at the county office have gotten some calls about people, they've had uh, pesticide sprayed and there is an exemption for after you spray in uh, your pesticides that you can, you can water a little bit more and you'd have to read the code of ordinances to find out exactly. It's a little bit much for me to go into right now, but they're like, oh, well, you put my sign outside and you can water as much as you want. And that's just not the case that we, you will get you will get a fine from code enforcement. Uh, don't believe anyone that tells you that, oh, my sign's here. You're good to water as much as you want. That is that is not the case. And I promise you, you will get a fine. And some people might think, oh, well, if I just do it in the middle of the night, they're all home in bed. They're not going to see if I do it on the weekends. They're at the beach, they're they're cooking on the grill, they're not going to see. No, they have to work at night and mm -hmm. on the weekends. And they go to um, gated communities. So even if you have a guard shack up front, they tell the guard, open the gate, please. We're coming in to drive around. So yeah, they're there. I think I can't remember, but it's I there's almost always at least one code enforcement officer driving around somewhere. I've seen them around some. Um, I still see in the middle of the day or on the weekends, mm -hmm. people's irrigation go on thinking, you're going to get caught. Mm -hmm. gonna get caught. Eventually, you, you will. Someone's going to get you. <laughs> it's, it's Andrew Dave, yeah. good morning. How are you? It's amazing how uh, a guy with... with less than beautiful wife and, and a home that is nothing special and a car that's 10 years old and, and the paint's faded will go berserk if his lawn isn't brilliant green and 
uh, it, it's almost a disease. You you wonder if, if it isn't some little brain implant that, that was put in there when they were a child because uh, bonds to, to some people are just so important. And uh, usually the, the people that are the most, that, that it means the most to end up being the head of the HOA. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and in homeowners associations, it is difficult. You do have rules. It comes down to a large extent on how those rules are enforced. And that comes down to who's in charge, you know, running the HOA. So that's a difficult situation. But I mean, there are ways to have an attractive looking lawn here in Spring Hill. You're going to have to settle for a mixture of things, learn how to live with the weeds, Keep it cut, but always cut it high because even if you have, like my lawn is maybe three quarters Bahia, the rest is a variety of different native ground covers and weeds. Even then, if you cut it too short, you're going to start killing stuff. You end up with a lot of bare dirt. My wife doesn't like to see bare dirt. She says, I want to see all the dirt covered and keep it cut. Other than that, she doesn't care specifically what species of plant is growing out there. And... I accomplished that and she's happy and we're all happy and hopefully my lawn will slow down soon. It's still growing pretty quick right now. I'm getting kind of tired of cutting it. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we just moved to a new, a new place over in Spring Hill and, uh, it had been vacant for a little over a month and the lawn, the, the grass was so high and I, uh, we're still in the process of moving, so I had to borrow uh, a mower, and it, I had to borrow an electric push mower, and it was like, man, it, it, it took it took a few passes. It was not fun <laughs> taking care of that. Yeah, you want to keep on top of it and keep yeah. it mowed. So even if you, you're growing mixed species, or it's also called a freedom lawn, you want to keep it looking nice. So if you keep it mowed and you cut it high, um, yeah, it can look really, really good. Something you need to keep in mind if you have a lot of different species of things growing in your lawn, when we change seasons, we go from summer into fall and then from winter into spring, certain things are going to die. Other things come up and start growing for that season. So you may end up with some brown areas from something that's just died for six months, but it'll come back. A lot of those species will wax and wane over the course of the year. Yeah, so, yeah. so your 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 cover makeup, like your percentage makeup of each species, is going to be different in the fall than it is in the middle of summer. It'll it'll change here and there um, as things will things will grow to take the place of things that died, and it'll go back when, when that season comes around next time. Yeah, my Bahia component really visually drops a lot during the winter, but then during the summer it comes roaring back and I end up with a pretty darn good looking Bahia lawn, mostly because I cut it high. People, when they cut the, even Bahia short, it really knocks it back and kills it and thins it out. So cut it high, gonna be a lot thicker. Yeah. We were talking earlier about the the monoculture lawn didn't didn't come about until the fifties. It it took uh, a weed control and and pest control and and a particular weed seed or not weed seed grass seed uh, in in northern states uh, before it was possible so if, if if you were around before the 50s and can remember back playing out in the yard the yard was a few different kinds of grasses uh, clovers dandelions uh, there were a lot of things in the lawn and, and that was the accepted lawn. If, if you went out and bought a bag of grass seed, it was mixed seed. And it had a few weeds in it. It uh, had all, all things that turned green. Some some were grasses and some weren't. And uh, the monoculture is, is a, a byproduct of moving to the suburbs and, and modern chemistry. So uh, before that, it didn't exist. Uh, now that it exists, people think that's been the norm forever and they have to have it. But uh, it wasn't. I, I remember being a, uh, a youngster and going out and, and getting dandelion greens that uh, 
grandma cooked and, and we had dandelion greens and I helped. And, uh, you know, that doesn't happen now. If you've got a dandelion, my God, we got to get some spray and get it on there quick because that thing's going to turn white and blow seeds everywhere. And we I'm going to get a letter dandelions and blow the seeds everywhere. So. <laughs> I'll get a letter from my HOA and my house will become worthless. The value will just drop <laughs> like a rock. Uh, get a lean on your house from a dandelion growing in your yard. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I do think that part of the, like with the, with the monocultures, it kind of relates to it. You have to remember, even if you live in the suburbs, like nature's still there and it's still a powerful force that has existed much longer than humans and will exist much longer after humans. You have to, you're not going to bend nature to your will. Nature's going to do its thing. So instead of trying to put your will onto it, you need to use what you got and take advantage of what works and what doesn't. And that is never a monoculture one. That is always a, a nice, diverse group of species in your yard. Well, the thing about it is grass is, is meant to be a perennial. Well, at least people want it to be a perennial. And uh, unfortunately, if, if you have a perennial, it has to have the correct environment. You know, if, if you're planting vegetables and your vegetables are annuals, you can pretty well grow them anywhere. You can, you can grow pretty much most of the vegetables here that you grew up north and you can do it because they're annuals and they have a, a, a short life and it, it's easy to adjust it when you plant them so that that short life uh, fits into our climate but when you start talking perennial anything uh, perennials you can't adjust the the growing season because of the growing seasons year-round and it, it, it's like the, the lilacs and the cherries and the apples, the palm trees. Uh, you know, the, everything that this perennial has a spot to be. And uh, people just really don't comprehend that, that that's the way of the world. You, you understand it easily with palm trees because you see no palm trees up north. And, and they're big and you see them here. And, and you immediately associate palms with being in the south. But uh, so many of these annuals, uh, you know, I want an apple tree down here. Why can't I have an apple tree? I, I, I want a cherry tree. Why can't I have a cherry tree? Uh, if you're in Miami, you're not going to get peaches that, that survive worth a darn. You know, it, it's possible any place. You, know, you could grow any palm tree you want in Indiana, but you're going to have to do some horrendous things to make it happen. Uh, and, and it's the same way with, with the grasses. You can grow grass in Florida, but it takes a, a, a skill to do it. And if you don't have that skill, uh, finding somebody to hire that does have the skill is very difficult. So Teresa's bringing up some, some pretty good uh, things here to uh, keep everybody on their toes. You know, if, if, if you get a really good education and, and know what you're talking about, it's scary to the other people because they think you're the genius and, and, and they leave you alone. But uh, just, just because uh, you've got a problem uh, doesn't really make you the expert. And unfortunately, uh, we, we find that all the time. You, you bring a problem to us, and, and we can solve 90% of them, but that little 10%, we know the people up at the university, and they can solve 90% of that 90%. But that always leaves a few that are going to go unanswered, and, and those are the ones that really make you think. So if, if you have what you think is a neat problem, uh, a difficult problem, and, and uh, you'd like some help, Boy, we'd love to get involved. We we really are good at fouling things up. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, and we know who to foul up at the university too. So, anytime you you have a, a a picture and you can send us a picture, we really do love pictures. Uh, we love problems. So, uh, give us a shot. Uh, makes our day. Yeah, Teresa's sharing a lot of really good links and. 
if you want to learn more, if you go to Hernando County Government's YouTube, so if you go to YouTube, look for that little search box up on the top, type in Hernando County Government, you'll find the Hernando County Government's YouTube channel. If you look under the playlist, there is one for Florida Friendly Landscaping, and our previous Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Lily Browning, has over a 100 recorded classes on there, and she covers turf grass and turf grass alternatives and ground covers that grow in a sunny area, shady area, whatever it might be. And there's also a playlist for me for Hernando County Extension with a lot of great classes on there. So we got a lot of, a lot of really good resources here for you other than just us Thursday morning. Uh-oh, we got some questions here. Oh, good. <laughs> Okay, Bernie, when do we trim our tree branches? For the most part, you can always trim branches when the tree is dormant. Uh, trimming a tree tends to uh, bring out a wound reaction in plants. And the, the reaction causes the things to go into a grow mode. And, and normally you don't want that to happen uh, or you wouldn't be trimming the, the thing. So if you don't want to introduce a, a, a growth spurt in the plant, trim it when it's dormant. Uh, most plants uh, will survive uh, trimming at, at any time. If, if you have a branch that, that is in the way of something, uh, you can take it off. Uh, and, and that really isn't going to hurt anything. But if, if you want to go out and reduce the canopy by a third and it's right in the middle of growing season, all you're going to do is end up with some horrendous growth. So try and try and take a time when the, the plant is doing its, its minimum growth when it's in its, its slowdown period. And for us, that's in the fall winter season, which lasts about two weeks in uh, between Christmas and uh, mid January. <laughs> so that that the optimum time then the answer to your question, optimum time for most trees is right after Christmas. Yeah, for a lot of different various fruit trees late winter, like before they leaf out and bud out and start flowering and start growing for the next year. You know, a lot of the plants, uh, like uh, azaleas, uh, that are going to bud on the new growth, you, you want to prune those immediately after the, they, they end their growth for this season. Uh, gardenias, uh, camellias, those kind of plants. Because if you, if you start pruning them in the fall, those plants, you will lose the, the buds for next season's flowers. You can prune them in the fall, but you're not going to have flowers in the next season. So it uh, depends entirely on the plant. And I'm a firm believer in if, if you have a plant and you want to do something, enter the name of the plant and the letters UF into your uh, search engine. It'll come up with whatever the University of Florida has to say. And, and you get information that's specific to Florida. If, if you just go online and you say, when can I do X? Uh, something will come on from the University of Connecticut or some private company out of Minnesota or somebody in California. And those things do not apply to us. California, although it has basically the same kind of temperatures, has a totally different climate in that they are very, very low humidity compared to us. And, and that presents a, a totally different set of problems to the plant. So if, if you get the University of Florida publications, you get the correct information. And a lot of the things that you would do maybe in, in March in Miami, you might not do until July uh, in the panhandle. So uh, 
where you are in the state becomes very, very important. We, we span uh, about four um, USDA districts. Yeah. Uh, so and we go from eight to 11 across the state. Things change dramatically. So uh, remember the advice that we're giving here normally applies to people uh, on a line from uh, Spring Hill to Orlando. And if you're uh, very far either side of that line, it may have a totally different uh, meaning to you. So uh, always yeah, be careful. We, and by the same time, before you spend the money buying a plant, look to plant up. What if, what if you are in love with a plant that's not going to survive here? Are you going to feel really bad when it dies? It's your fault. If, if it's the wrong plant in the right place, that's you. That's that's not the plant. So uh, I know we we kind of preach these things a lot, but they're important. And, and uh, newcomers constantly have this problem. You you move to the state, you spend a lot of money buying really pretty things, and and you get to watch them die. And and. By the time you understand what's going on, you've wasted a lot of money that you could have spent on pretty things that were going to survive. And it's all free. That's that's even the best part is the price is definitely right. So look it up. The university will do what it can to help you. Uh, if you can't find it, call us. We may not know, but we do know who does know. And we'll get you that information and we'll do it free. I love that. Free. That's that's something you don't get much of in Florida. Well, most of the information that we give here is kind of gen is geared for Hernando County, so generally nine A, nine B in Florida. Because I had a gentleman sent me an email about a tree and sent me a picture, and the tree was small. He had purchased it through a online nursery and wasn't doing really well. I think it was some type of specific variety of aspen tree. Aspen tree. We don't have aspen trees here in Central Florida. So I looked it up. I looked it up under the variety name that he had given me. It's native to Central California. Our weather is not like Central California at all. So it did not say that it grew particularly well in any part of Florida. So I told him, you're growing it really outside of the zone. You should know that. You can experiment. You're more than welcome to try but understand that it may not do well here just because of our weather, our temperatures, our annual high temperatures, cold temperatures might not be enough for it to do well. I'm not sure how, how well it turned out, but Colby shared a link here and I put this in the comments. Also, Colby, what does this link go to? So that link, if uh, you go there, that's everything FFL you have. All of our social media is the place you can sign up to take the FFL pledge. You have um, a sign up for our newsletter that uh, you'll get in a little over a week. Um, and every week I choose a native plant of the week to showcase and talk about um, the link to the IFAS article on said plant is there um also the youtube link that we talked about earlier there's a link on there if you click the youtube button it'll take you directly to all of the previous um florida friendly landscaping classes that are I on just the youtube did, channel and it took me right to the florida friendly landscape playlist on mm -hmm. youtube so it's a it's like an aggregate of everything <laughs> that i do anyway um it's there. Top shop yeah Okay, looks like Teresa's got a fan, and you know, we couldn't do this without Teresa. I couldn't normally make it through the week without her. Teresa was kind enough to help with a um, class I did on Tuesday on growing edibles in containers. I had the better part of 100 people on there, and then when it got to the end where people were asking questions, they were from Southern Georgia. They were from the Carolinas. I had somebody from... Western South Dakota, Zone 4, and they were asking questions. So Zone 4 is a little bit outside of my area of real expertise, but a lot of container gardening obviously works well no matter where you live. 
It's just your timing about when you grow specific things outdoors in containers is going to vary a little bit. So I love it when we have people nationwide on there. I think um, Eventbrite must have shared it nationwide. So mm. thank you, Eventbrite. We appreciate it. And Andrew, Dave, yes, it was recorded. It will be showing up within about a week or two on my playlist on Hernando County Government's YouTube. So we record pretty much everything to be able to save it and share it and show it again. And I know the answer to this one for trimming back hot pepper plants. Will it branch back up? Yes, it will. Hot peppers, if you plant them in the spring, they grow. Hopefully they get big and healthy. They got lots of flowers. You get a lot of hot peppers. When we get into the heat of the summer, they're going to get insect problems. They're going to look bad. They're going to get diseases. If you can keep them alive by the end of the summer, sometimes they look pretty darn bad, pretty worn out. But once we get into like right now, the days are just about short enough. And it's, I think this weekend is supposed to cool off by a degree or two. It's a start. But once it cools off a tiny bit in the fall, the pepper plants will kind of perk back up and flush out. So if you trim off all the dead, diseased, broken, seriously damaged branches, the plants will flush out and flower and give you another crop of hot peppers. Now, when we get further into winter and start getting freezing temperatures, you're going to have to protect them from that because hot peppers will freeze and they will die if it gets cold enough. So I got a picture to share here. Uh, let me go into the correct share screen. This is an email that was sent to me by a gentleman who spends the summers up north and he just came back down to Hernando County for the fall and winter and he has a lime tree and here we go I found it here's a picture of his lime tree and he was asking me what he could do to fix it Bernie not sure how well you could see that but it is, here, let me turn off the banner also so that you can see the base of it, which kind of helps with this. It's a lime tree. It has limes on it. It's lost most of its leaves. The rest look kind of yellow and green. Grass has grown up to around the base of the trunk. And he does have a little plastic protector there which is probably the only thing that saves the trunk from the long guy and his weed eater when he goes along trimming up. I sent him back information on citrus greening because it looks like his main problem is citrus greening, but probably a couple of other problems also. So Bernie, can we grow limes really well here in Hernando County? If you put them in a pot and put them inside in the winter and protect them. Limes are, are very, very cold sensitive. However, like everything else, I know of two lime trees that grow perfectly well uh, in, in microclimates here uh, that are very, very big trees and, and uh, put out tremendous amount of limes. It, it's probably 90% that it will not be successful uh, unless they're potted, but it, it, it's worth trying, but it's doubtful it's going to happen. But with citrus greening, uh, you're probably going to lose it from the greening anyway. Yes, yeah, citrus greening is incurable, untreatable. If your tree gets it, there's nothing you could do. I told him he could try clearing the grass out from around the trunk and underneath it, fertilizing it, see if it responds. But if it is greening, it's going to die no matter what you do. There's no no cure for it, basically. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of commercial citrus growths that looked like that with every one of the trees 
And uh, God, it, it has got to be a, a, a real tragedy for the citrus farming people. Uh, we're, we're down 60% uh, and, and still going down. And it, uh, it's going to make orange juice unbelievably expensive when this is over. It already is expensive. I know yeah. that if you uh, if you're out driving uh, on the outskirts, like in Lake County, uh, where like not really in Claremont because there's nothing, there's no tree, citrus trees in Claremont now, but outside in Groveland, and then if you're over towards like Tavares and Oconomowoc, if you're driving, there'll be a few. You'll see some remnant citrus farms, and there's you know there these are not operating anymore, but it's it's the saddest orange trees you've ever seen just out there, and it's like you look back and think, wow, I bet. This was really cool, you know, a long time ago. But now it's uh, it's just really sad, honestly. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of those old groves are just being plowed down, cleared out, and they put in subdivisions. So, mm -hmm. so Anne Marie asks, with that lime tree, did it freeze? And let me explain uh, a situation that happens with citrus. I know for a fact it happens with mangoes, and it can happen with a lot of other plants also, they get a whole complex of problems and they kind of pile on and add to each other. So a lime tree could, if it's not maintained and fertilized and grown and managed to be a healthy tree, and then it gets some cold damage, the cold damage weakens it. And then it may get a problem with nematodes in the soil. But if it was a really, really healthy tree, it'd be able to defend itself, but now it's weakened and it gets a nematode problem. Then it gets a fungal problem. And if it gets weaker, more and more problems kind of pile on. So it gets to the point where we look at a tree like that, and we think probably the primary thing that's wrong is greening. But there, if you if we examine that tree 100%, we had all the entomologists and plant pathologists from UF come down, we all examined it, we could probably find a half dozen different specific problems with it now because something happened and that just set the stage for it to get weakened and damaged and less able to protect itself. And unfortunately, that lime tree is probably on the way out. You know, uh, most citrus is, is grafted. And it's because most citrus uh, suffers from nematode problems. And by grafting the trees, we can get a, a nematode-resistant rootstock and we can grow uh, citrus in areas uh, with high nematode loading, and uh, they, they survive. Well, a lime tree is normally on its own rootstock. So it's one of the very, very few that you'll find that it's that way. And it's because they freeze easy. And, and uh, even if it's in an area that normally doesn't freeze, uh, it doesn't take much more than just a frost to kill it. And if it's on its own rootstock, it will come back uh, as, as the lime tree, where most citrus, if, if it gets killed from freeze, when the tree comes back, it comes back as whatever the rootstock is. And normally it, it's a, a, a sour orange or a rough lemon or one of those plants where uh, a lot of thorns, nasty they carry up and the fruit is terrible so uh, people think that the, the, the freeze made the plant turn into something bad actually the, the freeze killed the plant and the rootstock came back as whatever the rootstock really is uh, lime trees if, if they're in the ground and not potted if, if they get killed by the freeze uh, they do come back uh, normally from the rootstock and they come back as a lime tree again but uh, the the problem is if, if it's in an area where you get a freeze every year or a good healthy frost every year it's going to be regenerating this this thing every year and it, it's basically the tree's going to be one or two years old forever and it's not going to be producing anything to speak of so so it's an odd situation with lime trees uh, it's kind of a, a same problem with lemon trees. Uh, tea limes, I think all you have to do is shout cold and they fall over dead. Uh, so 
Although I knew of a key lime tree over in Sanford that was in a very protected backyard, a lot of big old trees, hedges and everything. That thing was like 20 feet tall. It was huge. It was like, it was the biggest and it was almost more bush shaped. Think arborvitae bush, a really, really big one. It was shaped like that, very dense. And they got bushels of key limes year round off of it. It was always flowering. Always had a little fruit and always had ripe fruit. But they were the only one. So out of 100 people that tried it, they were the ones who were successful. And the other 99 ended up with dead tree. Key lime's one of those that if you want to plant it in a pot, they are unbelievably successful as as a potted plant. They they really do well. Uh, They grow great. You can keep them pruned back to the size you want. About every four or five years, you pull it out do a little root pruning because it, it eventually grows to fill the whole container put it back in the pot and five years later you do the same thing and like you said limes all year long and they're great limes they're really uh-huh. good if, if you drink corona which i would never admit to uh, they, they do great in the corona. <coughs> important with mojitos also yeah and you have to grow mint have to grow your own mint for a proper mojito. You know, we need to do something on that. We need to, to get um, different things that you can grow in your yard for fresh cocktails. I think that's a good topic. Oh, yeah. I'll add that to my list. Yeah, of p- put it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of neat things. Pineapple would be great. Oh, yeah. You, you grow pineapple here. It takes a year or more for it to give you a pineapple normally. It depends. They're all different. Some are faster, some are slower. So you got to be patient. I remember my dad, when I was in high school, tried to grow. He was obsessed with trying to get this pineapple to grow. Or or not just a specific one, multiple. And they never make it. They get knocked over. Well, we had one that finally produced something that was big enough that we could take it off and try to eat it. So we took this pineapple off. It might have been the size of a softball. And that was the nastiest pineapple we have, I had ever eaten in my life. It was so bad. And I felt so bad for him because he was so excited for it. And it was just gross. Early settlers to Florida would grow pineapple. I mean, every every family homestead had a big patch of pineapples. They grow their own sugar cane, which is something else you can grow here. Mm-hmm. It's going to freeze in the winter, but you know you can grow it during the summer. They would ask sure. about root pruning. Uh, that's yeah. one of those things. Uh, bonsai wouldn't work if you didn't do root pruning. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if, if you keep the, the top of the plant small and you let the, the roots keep growing, eventually you have this monstrosity and there's no space left for soil in the pot. So uh, the, the trick is keep the, the root structure balanced with the plant size and you can keep them going forever. And it's, I don't know how long these bonsai plants live, but they, they live for a long, long time. And, and, and they do it just because they're so darn chopped down that that's all the bigger they're going to get. Yeah. Bob points out that, uh, with, um, growing pineapples, I've seen so many pictures on Facebook of people who had a pineapple and it's getting bigger and it's starting to color up. And then all of a sudden, either it disappears, it gets bit into, it gets half eaten. Yeah, I mean, we do have the wildlife to deal with everything. And this depends on where you live from raccoons to possums. Possums can damage things, squirrels, deer. If you live out in the country and you have deer, I'm not really sure what to tell you a lot of times. Sturdy fencing helps to keep them out of places where you don't want them to go. Deer, I think they don't like azaleas, but hibiscus is like crack for a deer. They love it. And they eat just about every other plant, so deer can make life difficult way out in the country. They strip my guavas. Oh. Do you still have guavas growing up? I do. Are they... They, do you they ever get any edible ones? Beating. What? Do you ever get any edible ones? Oh, yeah. Well, I won't this year. The, the, the freeze uh, zapped about half of them. 
but it, it, it's one of those things because we didn't pick them. Uh, I, I have just dozens and dozens of little trees that are growing and every one of those trees grows up and, and puts out a few guava. Uh, the, the fruit's delicious. But the thing that happens is one day you look out there and there's a, a herd of deer, six or eight <laughs> deer sitting out there munching away, and that's the end of them. Yep, a couple of deer can eat quite a bit. So, okay, Stephanie from Pinellas County has got a question. She's purchasing a 30-inch tall raised vegetable beds and have been reading that you can fill the bottom half with cardboard and logs. Will that attract termites? Probably. I'll give my opinion first. A lot of time, if you have, if you're purchasing or building some kind of raised bed and 30 inches is fairly deep, you can put stuff at the very, very bottom. You don't have to fill the whole thing with actual soil. So at the very bottom, you could put grass clippings, uh, fallen tree leaves. They're probably going to be the best pine needles you could even use twigs from let's say you trim a lot of hedges and bushes and create myrtle trees and things like that cut the branches up really small to put at the very bottom as filler because it's going to all break down and then you put you know at least a foot or two of soil on top of it for your vegetables and plants to grow in right away and the stuff at the bottom is going to turn into free soil eventually takes a little time if you were to use just throw fairly larger logs in there damp wood or subterranean termites would be attracted to that carpenter ants would be attracted to that they're both a part of the natural environment i mean i know at our office here we could go walking out the other side of the parking lot now behind the building there's some fallen down trees i'm sure i could find termites outside they're, they live outdoors. They're going to find it. So you may or may not get termites, may or may not get carpenter ants. You probably will get carpenter ants. They do a pretty good job of finding that kind of stuff. But that's not the end of the world either. Mm -hmm. So you got some carpenter ants in the raised bed. You work around them. <laughs> so, um, Bernie, what do you think? I, I think you're right. I, I think if you put logs in the bottom that uh, you would have termites, I don't think termites are going to affect anything it, uh, and and that will help turn that into soil quicker colby any ideas uh termites are attracted to two things and that's wood and water so if you have you know if you're watering plants in a bed with wood at the bottom that's that's a heaven for some termites but you know termites are gonna they decompose stuff. That's what they do. So that's going to help you. That's going to help in your your little micro ecosystem with your uh, your raised beds. But just don't put them near your house, and uh, you'll be all right. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I what right I would say. Your house. But I think termites are almost inevitable uh, in a in a raised bed like that, especially if it's made of wood. Yeah, termites are part of the natural environment. Some people think, oh, if I have termites anywhere on my property. I'll get them in my house. You may. We, I mean, we all have the potential of getting termites, but not necessarily. So, I mean, don't put wooden things, wooden structures right up against your house or right next to it. We also have dry wood termites. As Cindy points out, they have them in Pinellas County. We have them all over. They, they're pretty amazing. They don't need a whole lot of moisture. They will eat dry wood. They're the ones who get up in the attic and up in underneath your roof. I've even seen them in picture frames. A lady told me years ago, she had dry wood termites. She said one evening, a picture she had hanging on the wall fell off and the glass fell off, smash, it broke on the ground. She went up and looked at the frame. There was no wood in the frame. It was just the varnish that was on the outside. Dry wood termites had gotten into it and eaten all the dry wood in the wood frame and eventually everything gave way and the picture came crashing down. Dry wood termites, um, what they do eat, they're able to squeeze every, literally every last molecule of water out of it. And when they poop, it's this intricately shaped little flat-sided ball 
think like soccer ball, kind of looks like a soccer ball under a microscope. And if you see little piles of that on windowsills and in your house, that's when you want to call an expert or start thinking that I, know, I might have dry wood termites. So we got dry wood termites too. But well, I see those little, little piles of sawdust are a, a giveaway, man. That, and they are just amazing when you look at them with a, a really high power lens or under a microscope. That that little flattened shaped bulb makes you wonder uh, what they're shaped like internally. That they, yeah. they squeeze <laughs> How do they do that? And I see Teresa is just having a grand old time today finding up resources for all of you and putting it back in the chat. Uh, she's even found some ideas about what to do with deer, uh, some different recipes and way to prepare them. I'm not the expert on that, but there's a lot of information out there on that topic. Um, Bob says, uh, mentioning Hugo uh, culture, something like that which is a way of piling up brush in this nap, covering it with soil and make, it's a way of making raised beds naturally. So it has a lot of organic matter in it. That's going to break down over time. I'm not the expert on it. I, I'm familiar with the term, but never really read up much of it. Um, dug a three foot deep bed in the backyard, lined the bottom of wood chips from the tree service, filled the top with mushroom compost, oak leaves as mulch, Years later, it remains one of his most productive beds with almost no additives, and you probably use a lot less fertilizer on it, and the plants probably grow really well. I did a class with um, Agent with Extension from Marion County, and we we're talking about some different vegetables that do really well. He said he's amazed at how well sweet potatoes and seminal pumpkins grow in the summer out of a compost pile. He said he's had both just pop up wild. Naturally, obviously, at some point they're thrown in a compost pile. They sprouted, grew up in the compost pile, grew like weeds all summer long, said biggest sweet potatoes he's ever seen in his life. He dug up out of a compost pile. So that organic matter, plants love growing in it. And as long as you use different clean sources of organic matter, so... Be a little careful about if you're uh, shredding treated wooden pallets or treated wood, if you're using grass from a lawn where a service sprays it with things that you're not really sure what they sprayed it with. You may want to stay away from that. But things like wood chips, uh, mushroom compost, oak leaves, they all break down eventually. Some faster, some slower. They all break down. And the key to having a fantastic vegetable garden here in Central Florida is build up that soil. Trust me, once you get there, you will be amazed at how well your plants grow, how productive they are. They're not going to wilt as bad when it gets sunny and hot. You're not going to have to fertilize them as much. They, they don't take care of themselves, but they do great. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, Bob says Seminole pumpkins, very easy to grow any place. I, grew, I haven't grown them successfully let, yet. I did grow calabasa last summer, Cuban pumpkin. Just let it go. Just let them roam all over the backyard all summer long. They got caterpillars I sprayed once. I ignored it the second time. And I ended up with four great big 20-pound squash off of it. So, Hugo culture, that's it. I was struggling for the words that Teresa shared. The, and this is similar to lasagna gardening and a lot of other gardening techniques where you put a lot of organic matter in there to begin with, soil on top. And the organic matter, the rougher stuff is going to decompose over time. Works really, really well. If you think about it, uh, you, if you come upon one of the rare undisturbed ecosystems uh, that we have, that's how, I mean, all those plants look pretty healthy for the most part. And that's because naturally that's, that's the state that they exist in. It's amazing how well the weeds alongside of the highway in July and August <laughs> grow. Bernie, you have quite a bit of property there. Does all your stuff, like the, the weeds and the, the uh, dog fennel and stuff like that, do you have to do a whole lot to encourage it to grow and look good and healthy? No, I don't do anything. I I uh, mow 
uh, most of it only four or five times a year. Um, I, I found that uh, leaving as much organic material uh, on the ground as possible uh, has added, uh, and, and we've been there 30 years now, and, and the soil is really now fairly decent. It's an old orange grove. It was really depleted when we, we first got it. It had no organic material at all. And basic about the only thing grew was sand spurs. So uh, now we've got uh, very good grass. Uh, and uh, the weeds are, are not that big a problem. Uh, the, the county brought in some, some soil uh, for the road uh, that had some new things, some terrible things, uh, brought in thistle and uh, uh, some uh, little, little white flowers that touch me knots. Uh, and and I've had a hard time getting rid of those. But other than that, I, I pretty much leave it alone. And uh, I, I find it uh, where, where I had the garden, uh, I put in a lot of organic material and uh, took about two years before that that started to really pay off. And and while I was gardening, that that area really was was good. You cannot uh, have too much organic material uh, in the garden area. It's uh, you know it, it does everything you need. It provides uh, everything the plant needs, and it provides a great base for the microbes to make all that stuff available to the plants. So. If, if you really want to garden well, uh, you need the microbes, you need the organic material. Uh, everything else pretty much takes care of itself if you've got those two. Okay, it looks like our hour is drawing to a close here. Well, Bernie, we got one more question here. Bob wants to know about back to grasses. How do you handle blanket grass? That's a very difficult grass to get rid of. Um, Probably uh, the only thing that really works good on it uh, is Roundup. And, and it's maybe a two or three year proposition to get rid of it. If, if there's any pieces left in, in the soil uh, that are alive, it just keeps coming back. It, it does do a beautiful job in the shade, uh, but it, it does take over. It does keep running. Uh, it, it's... You know, if you got an oak tree that that's and it's around the oak tree, don't worry about it. But if, if you really want to get rid of it, uh, just pulling it isn't going to do any good. Uh, you've got to get rid of every last piece of root, and uh, because it, it perennial, it, it will take uh, a Roundup type product, probably three years. Yeah, and there's a couple of other weeds and grasses. Torpedo grass is the same way. You can pull it all up, but you're not going to get rid of it by pulling it up. And a lot of people um, recommend, a, you know, mixture of vinegar and salt and this and that. Ain't going to work on torpedo grass. Uh, torpedo pop. grass is a it's a it's a tough one to deal with. I, when I did invasive plant management, that was when we had a lot. Lots of herbicide. Yeah, Teresa put a link to the fact sheet on um, blanket grass up. And there's a lot of very closely related grasses that we just kind of call blanket grass as, a, as an overall catch-all. There are different various species, different species of crabgrasses, this and that. They're probably all controlled pretty much the same. They look very similar. You have to get, and I mean, we have weed picture books here to try to get it down to exactly what it is. You know, there, there are some chemicals that, that will take care of those, but for the most part, they're, they're not uh, registered for lawn use. So if, if it's in a field, that's one thing. If it's in your lawn, uh, that's something else. And uh, the, the feds are, are really touchy. Most, most of those products that are gonna do a great job uh, are restricted use products and, and take somebody with a license to get them. So 
if, if somebody tells you about this wonderful product that, that will get rid of these things, uh, if, if it's true, you're probably not going to be able to buy it because it's going to be restricted. Yeah, there are products that you have to be, you know, licensed um, personnel to be able to purchase and apply. So, guys, wow, it looks like I'm showing some pretty good uh, time management skills here. It looks like it is just clicked to 11 a.m. So, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in live. For anybody who's watching a recording of this, I went ahead and showed my email address at the bottom. I put down Colby's email. Feel free to email us. Uh, go back and check out the links and the information on the screen for our uh, Hernando County Government's YouTube channel. A lot of good information there. Colby's link tree link. If you need any help or if you couldn't find the link or whatever, get a hold of us. We're here to help. And I believe that we're going to be here again next thursday to help but oh yeah i got a surprise for colby um colby do you think you can run things next week because i was hoping to take wednesday thursday Goodness. friday off uh yeah oh i'll plan on it i'll make you an admin and i'll show you real quick how to, okay. how to go about doing it it's really not hard lily picked it up right away so <laughs> okay <laughs> and i'm sure bernie's planning on being back here with you right bernie oh i'll help yeah. i hope so i don't know what i'd do without him <laughs> Just, just you read the questions and make Bernie answer them. <laughs> so I see Teresa put up some links here also for basket grass, which is a little bit different from blanket grass. And other than that, ah, next week we're gonna play Let's Stump Colby. <laughs> oh, let's let's not. <laughs> I'll be off, but you know what? I'm amazed at just how well this on the platform and everything looks on my phone. So mm -hmm. I'll even tune in at, at 10 o'clock next Thursday morning and uh, uh, add some questions and comments, I think. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you very much. All of you, hope you have a wonderful weekend. The weather, at least here in Central Florida, is supposed to be beautiful this weekend. So go out, have some fun, work in the garden. That's what I need to do. Cut your grass, hopefully for the last time. And we will see you back here again next Thursday. You won't see me, but you'll see Colby and Bernie. And until then, everybody have a great week. Bye.